Hello my lovely friends, my name is Ava and today we're going to be talking about the nine books that I've read so far in December. Baby, baby. This is probably the smallest number of books that I'm having in a wrap up or even a mid-month wrap up throughout the whole year that I've been making these mid-month wrap ups. That might be in part of I am filming this video two days early. I normally film these videos like exactly on the 15th of every month. Today is the 13th that I'm filming this and that is because I will not be home in the next couple of days for the next couple of days because I will be at my school for a couple of days before graduating on the 16th. So I graduate in three days. When you're saying it, it's two days. <laughs> two days from now, I will be a college graduate. So <laughs> um, it's nerve wracking. I'm going to be uh, staying in my college town for the two days before I graduate and so I will not have any of my filming equipment or my background or my setup or my books or anything so I'm just gonna get this done get this done now you know because of that I don't have more books to talk about today because I am close to finishing two books but I'm not talking about them in this video because I have not finished them yet so you will have to figure out what those are uh at the end of December. The first book that I ended up reading in December is Chimera for Christmas by Ursa Dax. I saw this cover and was super interested. I've also been having Ursa Dax on my radar because a lot of my favorite monster romance lover creator content creators really loves Ursa Dax and so I have been keeping my eye on her and so I saw that she had a Christmas novella, a monster Christmas novella. I was like you know what gonna pick that up so I did. <laughs> this one is actually really cute even if it is with the monster. I love monster romances that are super cute and sweet that is totally my vibe. Our heroine Sophie is in need of a job and she ends up getting hired as a seasonal worker in this space station to work at this coffee shop. Uh, it's called um, Hallowed Be Thy Bean or something like that. It's really cute. Anyway it's a small little coffee shop hole in the wall and she gets hired to work there and her co-worker is this chimera alien named X. Um, I think like he doesn't have a real name. Um, he just has like a serial number he was like given at birth with like a bunch of his other chimera brothers and sisters. And um, he was supposed to be like a chimera war soldier and he got out of that. And so now he works at this coffee shop and he's this big giant monster alien and he's working in this cute little coffee shop and he loves it so much. He loves his job. He's very grumpy and some of the customers are scared to come buy coffee because they're scared of this giant warrior dude. And so when Sophie gets hired on the job, more people come to their coffee shop and she's very welcoming and sunshiny. So this is definitely a grumpy sunshine romance and the two of them can't help but fall in love. They also live on the space station. It's kind of like mini hotel rooms that they live in that's separated on the space station and they end up actually living in the same sector of rooms even one scene that lives in my head rent free where okay so x lives on the space station full time whereas sophie is a seasonal worker so she's just there for a few months so she doesn't get like a full room like x does like x has a full bathroom in his room closet like everything like he has a full out apartment you know but he knows that sophie <laughs> uh lives in the same sector as him and so he decides to use the communal showers in the section just at a chance of like not glimpsing her in that way just to like get a glimpse of her and, and like just to see her see her out of the work setting and um they of course bump to each other in that in that time in that place and they end up being shower buddies like their shower stalls are right next to each other and um very good. You might think the ex is creepy based off of that. He's not creepy. He's a total sweetie pie. I love him. This was definitely a cute and hot monster Christmas novella that I really recommend picking up or tropes in this one. It's a Christmas romance. It's Grumpy Sunshine. It's on Kindle Unlimited. It's a monster romance and it is a novella. I give this one four out of five stars. I then decided to pick up two Cassie Mint novellas, a part of the same series. She just came out with the Very Merry Mob series. So the first one is Mistletoe Mobster. I've been hearing all my friends like talk about and read this one and I think I liked it more than everyone else did. Everyone gave it like three stars or less. I gave this one a solid four. I actually was so into it. So Leah is a bookshop owner and then one day when she's closing up, she hears like a knock on the door. She's like, sorry, we're busy, closed. And this guy has, is like, please let me in. Like I'm injured, like he's bleeding from his chest. And she very kindly lets him in and tries to treat his wounds. He calls someone to come pick him up and like take care of him. And she finds out that he's in the mob. And ever since that 
point, the hero whose name is Nico cannot get this woman out of his head. He stalks her after that point and just can't get enough of Leah. I thought this was really fun and sweet. Not sweet, but kind of sweet. Nico was like so sweet for Leah, even though he was stalking her. I don't know. I really like this one. Like I don't, I don't get why people didn't. Like I thought it was fun. Anyway, <laughs> some people just didn't like this one. I did. It was like a fun, cute, short, stalking romance. We're going in here for blood and violence. Uh, tropes, it's a Christmas novella, it's on Kindle Unlimited, it's a mafia romance, there's a possessive hero, it's a novella, and we're dealing with a stalker. Again, I gave this book four to five stars. So then I read the follow-up novella that's currently out, which is Silent Night, and this one, I guess I was like everyone else and I didn't really enjoy this one. Um, I gave this one three, 2.5 stars, and this is a short little novella about a mafia man falling in love with his mafia boss's little sister, and so it's forbidden, kind of like a bodyguard-ish but he's a doctor, not a bodyguard. And it's very forgettable. I don't remember anything else about it. So three stars. Next is a book that I have been putting off for a while, but I finally got to. This is A Curse of Queens by Amanda Boucher. This is her fourth book in her Kingmaker Chronicles. And I love the Kingmaker Chronicles. There's a stack of them right here. <laughs> the first three. The first three are about the same couple. Um, Cat and Griffin and then this one kind of like veers off into a different romance. So I believe other books in the series are going to be about a different couple, a part of the friend group, kind of like inner circle that was the first three books in this series. So this one is about two characters that you have met in the previous books. I really recommend reading these books in order. You could read this one as a standalone, but I feel like you'd be so lost with the world building, first of all, because that really gets set up in the other books in the series and these characters, because these two have been pining over each other and you've been reading about their longing glances and their tension in the other books in the series. Um, and so this one's about Jocasta and Flynn. So Jocasta is the younger sister to Griffin, who's the hero from the first three books right there. And Flynn is one of Griffin's oldest best friends who was a part of the inner circle grouping warriors that we met in the first three books. Jocasta and Flynn have some history, okay? So they are 10 years apart and I believe on her 16th birthday, you read in the beginning of this book, like the first chapter, it's her 16th birthday. And um, she thinks that Flynn knows how she feels. Like she has been totally hardcore crushing and loving Flynn, who is 10 years older than her and has always been a constant like in her life and in her family's life. And she decides to get up enough nerve to uh, kiss him on her birthday. And he is totally shocked and doesn't really know what to do. And she reads his reaction as rejection. And so they haven't really been the same close ever since then. Before she kissed him, they were like best friends, did everything together, were really close. It's years later, I believe like eight years later, and um, things are still rocky. Like things have been rocky ever since that point. Jocasta just felt rejected by the man that she loves. And Flynn feels like he's not good enough for Jocasta. He is so in love with her. He's even saved himself for her. He's never been with any other woman, has not kissed any other woman than Jocasta. There's even one point in the book where I think they have another kiss and he lets it, like the beans spill that his last kiss was Jocasta all those years ago. Like that was his first and only kiss. And she was like, what? <laughs> like she's shocked. Anyway, you've been waiting and waiting and waiting for this romance between Joe and Flynn and it did not disappoint in my book. Kat, the heroine from book one, is dealing with some things. I don't wanna spoil the other books in the series, so I'm just gonna say that. She's dealing with something and she needs help and Jocasta knows where to find this magical object that will help her. And so Jocasta and Flynn and a few other people in their ragtag group of friends end up going on a journey. I love fantasy journey romances to find said object. While they're on this journey, some of the people like get split up and Joe and Flynn are stuck together for a portion of the book and they kind of reveal their feelings and they finally get together you know <laughs> i really liked how you got to see these two and how they were before this point and i believe in book three or book two i don't remember but in one of the other books in the series you really got to see these two before book four and i really liked seeing their progression from that book to this one i just love amanda Boucher's writing i love this world i love all of these characters and the mythological aspects that she put in this book was amazing. I love this series so much. If you have not read this fantasy romance series yet, 
get on it get on it uh, for tropes in here it's age gap fantasy romance there is definitely longing um there are people going on a quest there is magic involved and there is royalty the heroine in here is actually a princess i gave this book 4.5 out of 5 stars just because it wasn't that full five star level for me but I still really, really, really loved it. I decided to pick up Strake by Ruby Dixon next. This is her third book in the Corsair Brothers series, which is her series all about a group of brothers and Strake, who's not one of the brothers, but he's one of the men in this group. <laughs> anyway, um, you have these four brothers, these three brothers, and you have Strake. So this group of four space pirates. So it's a series about these four space pirates. Each guy in this group has their own book. So this is book three, Strike's book. This is a series you definitely need to read in order. Please start with Adiron, the first book, and then you will understand book three way more. Um, but you read about in book one how Strike abandoned the other people on the spaceship. I can't say anything more than that. He abandoned them, okay? And so the heroine here, Ruth, <laughs> She actually snuck on to Strake's spaceship before he abandoned them because she wanted to spy on him. And then she didn't know that he was like leaving them. And so the people in the other spaceship think that he kidnapped Ruth, but he didn't. She snuck onto his spaceship. And so for like weeks, she has been living in the air ducts in his spaceship and has been stealing things from him, ruining things for him, like playing pranks on him while she's in these air ducts. And he doesn't know that this woman is in his spaceship. And even his like crew is like helping her sneak through the ship and like hide from him. It's so funny. It's like sneaking her food. There's even points where like she gets so annoyed with Strike that she like takes out all of the threading from like all of his clothes. And so his clothes just keep falling apart and he thinks bugs have gotten into his spaceship or like rodents or something and is eating all of his clothes. And he's like so upset. And while he's like trying to command his ship, his clothes are just falling off of him in tatters. And she's like snickering in the um, air vents. Like it's so funny. She is making Strake think that he is just losing his mind. <laughs> I loved it. Anyway, of course he ends up finding her. One day she decides to take a bath in his very elaborate bathtub. And he walks in on her taking a bath. And she's like, oh, I've been found out. No. And so he ends up chaining her to his bed. And things go from there. It turns to a captive captive situation. He's not very happy about this little human playing all these tricks on him and aggravating him to no end. This was such a delightful read. I was smiling through this book. I loved it. The banter in this one is 10 out of 10 would recommend. And I love the slow progression from like hate to okay to lovers, you know, like hate you're okay to lovers. <laughs> Ruth and Strake in here were great. I really loved their romance. I don't know if this one's my favorite in the series yet. It's either this one or book one. I don't know. Um, but for tropes in here, it's an alien romance. There's a captor captive situation and there is amazing banter. I gave this one five out of five stars. <laughs> the next two books I can't really talk about. I'm just going to mention that I read them. I did read A Lady of Rook's Grave Manor by Catherine Moon for my five star predictions video for 2022. That video will be out before the end of 2022. I have that scheduled and almost ready to go, almost finished for y'all. So um, that video will be out then. It's like my last video of the entire year, so you can look forward to that, but I did read this book. If you didn't know, this is a Why Choose Monster Romance that has like taken Romance 2 by storm, and I haven't really heard a lot of people talk about it now, but a lot of people read it last year, I'm pretty sure, and it was a lot of people's favorites, so it was on my five-star predictions for 2022. I also ended up reading Devil in Disguise by uh, Lisa Kleypas. This was also on my five-star predictions for 2022, so you'll know my thoughts in that video. I'm not gonna talk about it here. This is the seventh book in the Ravenel series, which is a historical romance series, and it's actually a second generation romance, first being the Wallflowers. So one of the couple from the Wallflowers, this is their daughter, Merit, and she ends up falling in love with a Scotsman named Kier, I'm pretty sure, Kier, and um, yeah. There's also an amnesia trope in here. Very interesting. So you know my thoughts in my five-star prediction vlog. <laughs> I then decided to pick up Work For It by Talia Hibbert, which is, I believe, the last book that I had to read from her before I read all of her backlist. I think I have like one little novella to read and then I'm done. 
And man, what a way to end reading Talia's backlist. I saved a fantastic one for last. This is a MM, male male romance between Keynes and Griffin. You met Keynes in, I believe, book two in this series. His sister was the heroine of book two. I would say you probably get more out of this series if you read them in order, because this is the last book, book four. However, all the other ones were like four or three stars for me. And this one was everything and blew it out of the, all the other series out of the water. But you read Keynes as a side character in the previous books in the series and so you've seen him kind of struggling. He's dealing with depression. He was in a toxic relationship and he just got out of it and he like hates himself at the beginning of this book. Like he utterly hates himself and um, decides to take a vacation from life. Basically he does that. When he's struggling with his mental health, with just everything with his life, he decides to run away. From his life and goes on a vacation to a hole in the wall somewhere and he decides to go to this very small town in England. I can't remember the name of it currently um but there he ends up meeting one of the residents Griffin. He is kind of like the town grump kind of or the town is pariah the right word? He's the person that everyone steers clear from that everyone is wary of that everyone glares at when they walk down the street and it's not because he did anything he's this gentle giant of a man it's just like he looks kind of scary he's very huge <laughs> he's huge it's a very small town so you have small town vibes especially with people judging you in small towns and his mother was not someone that everyone liked she was quite awkward and kooky people would say and she ended up taking her own life and people don't really care for griffin because of that which very sucky. Anyway, so he's kind of ostracized by his small town. Um, but Griffin loves his town. He loved his mother. He loved his home that he lived in with his mother. He lives in that house now. And um, he loves the, um, is it like orchard or something along those lines, like farm that he works on. And he makes a lot of recipes on this farm and bakes and cooks in it. Anyway, I just want a little tangent about Griffin, but I love Griffin. He's this big gentle giant. And right when he see, sees Olu, who is Keens, um, he is like smitten. They're at the one bar in the town and he goes up to Keens and decides to be his little awkward self, even though he's huge, and try and sort of conversation with him. And um, things are not great upon their first meeting. Keens is having kind of like a PTSD moment and he takes it out on um, Griffin and screams at him and yells at him when in actuality he is just hating himself and is projecting that onto Griffin and they do not end on like leave each other in amicable terms until the next day when the owner of the rancher farm that Griffin works in tells um, him that Keynes is visiting is going to be writing an expose on their farm or orchard or whatever. I don't know what it is. Anyway, and so they have to spend time together. And while they spend time together, Keynes is growing in himself. So is Griffin. Griffin is growing into who he always wanted to be and um, trying not to live in his mother's shadow anymore. And Keynes is starting to care for himself. He's finally taking his prescribed medication. He's finally listening to others, listening to himself, listening to his body and falling for this giant man. <laughs> Both men were super relatable to me, which is saying a lot because it takes it takes a lot for a man to be relatable to me, you know? Uh, but but these men were like Tali Hebert, oh, is such an amazing author that to make me feel this way. But Keynes with his like depression and his internal struggle with his but it's just his mind and the way he feels about himself. Oh my gosh, I loved him. And then um, Griffin, oh, I felt him with his self-confidence issues that he's working with and just his feelings on the outside world and how people treat him. And like, oh, I loved him. I just loved reading about them and I loved their romance and they're just a fantastic couple and fantastic characters. Tali Hibbert did an amazing job at developing the romance, but also just developing them as people. I loved it. Trigger warning in here. These are the trigger warnings that Talia wrote herself for her book. She says there's depression, anxiety, references to past sexual trauma and forced outing, references to parent who died by suicide. Uh, tropes, there's an age gap. There's a 10 year age gap. Um, Keynes is 10 years older than Griffin. Um, there's a bigger hero, which is Griffin. Um, it's a caretaking scene. I believe Keynes gets like beat up by some neighborhood teenagers for some reason, I can't remember why. And so, 
um, Griffin ends up coming across him and um, also an injured fox and they take care of this injured fox together and he takes care of Keynes and goes super cute. Um, it's a foodie romance because Griffin does a lot of cooking. There's mental health representation. It's a male male romance and it is a small town romance. I gave this book five out of five stars. The book that I ended up finishing last night, the last book for this video is When She's Mary by Ruby Dixon. This is her newest release. I just love that she released a holiday novella. I love the rest of her series. And so I thought this was such a treat to read. It's only like 120 pages and I loved this. I think I want to give it five stars. So the rest of her books are basically a collection of romance books that happen on this planet called Rizda 3. So if you read a book like 0.5 in this series, you get to read about this alien who's very rich. And he um, like one of the richest aliens in like the whole galaxy. And he ends up across Millie, who is a human woman who was a slave and ends up saving her, falling in love with her, marrying her. And then he realizes, oh my gosh, there's a bunch of human women who get like illegally taken from earth and can't go back to earth and they're like lost and don't have a place to stay so you know what i'm gonna make them a planet i'm going not make them buy a planet for them and have human refugees there like able to live out their lives and like have farms and live fulfilling lives and so that's what rista 3 is rista 3 is a planet for human refugees to live devon is one of those human refugees who lives on rista 3 so she owns this farm on the planet and she has a next door neighbor and she was kind of elderly and she is very depressed like her neighbor is she's a shut-in and Devin just really wants to help her she really wants to cheer her up make her just happier and the way that she thinks she can do this is by putting in some Christmas cheer into her home it's about to start snowing and she's like you know what how about we celebrate Christmas since it's going to be snowing and she asks one of the kind of like policemen that are there to help humans his name is oh what's his name it starts with an s Sinath, Sinath, <laughs> it sounds like snack. Sinath, Sinath, um, asks him to help her find a Christmas tree, but there's no Christmas trees on this planet. And so they have to get a little creative um, and they don't really start off on the right foot because <laughs> Sinath um, previously tried to like kill her pet. So um, <laughs> Devin in here has adopted this rodent that's like native to the planet. I think of him as like a possum in my brain, like he looks like a possum. Anyway, this possum, I'm gonna say it's a possum, it's not a possum. But this possum is like her pet named Jerry. <laughs> and he like hangs out on Devin's shoulders, like her pet, like he's been t given like all the shots, like he's a pet, okay? He's not carrying any diseases or, you know. Anyway, and she treats him as a pet and previously <laughs> Sinath tried to kill him because <laughs> he thought there was like a rodent overtaking her farm or whatever. She's like, no, that's my pet, Jerry, don't kill Jerry. And so Sinath tried to kill Jerry at one point. So they're not on great terms. <laughs> this was really fun. I love this. They get a tree trying to cheer up her neighbor and the three of them just become really close and celebrate Christmas together. And it was just so sweet. I really loved this. I gave this five stars. It could put me in a great, great Christmas mood. Anyways, there you have it. Those are the nine books that I've read so far in December. Please let me know if you've read any of these books or if you plan to. And if you don't feel like commenting any of those things, you can leave me any Christmas related emoji in the comment section down below. But anyways, thank you all so, so much for watching. I will see y'all soon in my next one. Bye y'all. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day.